Good morning. Uh, it's great to have you with us today. I'm here with Eden Sears. Eden's one of the members of our church. He's uh, been coming here for several years now. And uh, he's going to be preaching for us this morning. And so we thought it'd be great to kind of hear a little bit of the story, let you know a little bit about Eden before he comes and opens God's Word. So Eden, uh, you grew up in California. You came here before it was cool to do so. And uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. Yes, I was a pioneer in coming to Arizona long before many Californians did. Uh, 2011, I moved out here. But I was born and raised in San Diego, California. My uh, mother and father got divorced when I was six years old. And that same year, my mother decided to go into a homosexual relationship. And that was taboo in California, you know, back in the 1980s. I found the Bible, it was in my house somewhere, somehow. And I read the entire book of Revelation. And from that moment on, I really felt that there was, I was awakened to the idea that there was a spiritual world that I was a part of, but I had no direction uh, on, on how to pursue that. So let me, do you know where the Bible came from? I have no idea how it got in my house. So somehow someone gave a Bible. Yep, somehow it was in my house, I found it, and the only book I read was Revelation. And it was pretty much so mind-blowing that I... That's an easy one to start with. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, why start you know, with John or, yeah. or, or, or Genesis? I, I went to Revelations for some reason. Uh, but without any kind of guidance on, on where to go, I just kept on living life. And my mother remarried a two man when I was uh, a freshman in high school, I was 14. My family, my mother, my stepfather, my sister, everyone was involved with drugs. And so when I was in the ninth grade, I smoked marijuana for the first time, uh, got involved with that. And I also started to go to a local bookstore which specialized in uh, new age material, witchcraft, Wiccan stuff. So what happened was, where the story begins to change, I was about 17 years old at the time, my mother uh, was leaving work and she was going to go stop and get some drugs before she came home. And she rode a motorcycle. She tried to swerve around a large truck and got into a pretty, pretty severe car accident. And she was laying in the hospital, you know, doing one of those stretcher things. And she had a come to Jesus moment where she really realized she's made some terrible mistakes in her life and came to Christ. Every week she would say, Eden, do you want to come to church? Eden, do you want to come to church? And at this point, I'm, I'm about 18 years old. And I kept saying, no, you know, thank you, mom, but you know, not this time, maybe next week. Kept putting her off. Finally in September, she said, look, my church is having this invite your family to church thing. We're gonna have a picnic afterwards. I'd really like you to come. And, so just to get my mother off my back, I said, okay, I will go. And uh, so I went to church that weekend and uh, that Sunday, and for the life of me, I cannot remember what the pastor preached on. I really wish I could, but the message was given, an, uh, an altar call was given at the end, and I was the only person in the congregation to raise my hand and come forward. So two things kind of stand on that story. One. Um, your life, your background, your mom's background are often the kind of pictures of people we sometimes shy away from sharing the gospel with because we think, well, they're, they're too far gone. They're, they're too messed up. Um, what, what would you say to someone who's here today and, or, or even like your mom, you know, she'd invited you and invited you and they've got a friend or a family member they think is too far gone or maybe They've got someone they've invited and they've tried to share the gospel. They keep turning down and turning down. What would you say to that person? I would say keep asking. Um, if you stop asking, the chance of them coming is almost 100%. But if you keep asking, keep being present there for them. They may never say yes, but they may say yes at some point. And God willing, you'll have the opportunity to lead them to Christ. Great. Well, thank you for sharing your testimony and we look forward to hearing you share God's Word with us this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. How are you all this morning? Awesome. The things we do to get our mothers off of our back. 
Uh, my name is Eden Sears, as you just heard, and I'd just like to start this morning by expressing my gratitude to Pastor Whitney, Pastor Andy, the staff here at Willow Hills for giving me the opportunity to share the gospel with you guys this morning. And I'm going to pick up right where we left off last week. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, we have been going through the gospel of Matthew. And uh, today's passage is going to be in Matthew 38. But before we go there, I want to recap something at the beginning of the chapter. So Matthew 12 opens with Jesus and his disciples walking through a field of grain. And they're picking the grain on the Sabbath day, and they're eating it. They get busted in the process. And the Pharisees begin to question Jesus about breaking the Sabbath laws. Jesus very kindly lets them know that they have a misunderstanding about what the Sabbath is about. And that brings us to verse 5 of Matthew 12. He says, Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, that is, they're doing work on the Sabbath, but they are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Now keep that phrase in mind, something greater than the temple is here. And with that, let's look at our main passage today, beginning in verse 38. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So hopefully you guys were able to pick up on those three things. Something greater than the temple, something greater than Jonah, something greater than, the, than, than Solomon. We're going to put a pin on that one and we'll circle back to it because first we need to answer a few questions about this passage, such as who is Jonah, why the sign of Jonah, and what does he mean by an evil generation, and why do they seek a sign, and how do we prevent ourselves from ending up in that group? So let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time uh, to open up your word and to hear from you. Father, I thank you for everyone who is here this morning, and I just ask that you would come and be with us and reveal your truths to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first question is, who is Jonah? Now, this scripture has very, very little to do with Jonah. But for those of you who have not heard, perhaps, Jonah was a prophet in Israel, Jonah is given an assignment by God to go to the city of Nineveh and give them a message of mercy, forgiveness, repentance. Jonah doesn't like this at all. The Ninevites, the Assyrians, they were terrible neighbors. They were cruel, they were mean, they were warlike. He did not want them to receive God's mercy at all. He would have preferred to see them judged and condemned and destroyed. So instead of going to Nineveh like he should have, he gets on a boat and he basically sails towards Portugal. God has to turn him around. He does this by whipping up a storm. The sailors on the ship throw him overboard and Jonah gets eaten by a giant fish. You'd think that was the end of Jonah. He's dead. He's been eaten by a fish, but no. Three days later, a fish vomits him up on the seashore. You can only imagine how bad he smelled. And then he finally goes to Nineveh. He gives them the message of repentance. They receive the message of repentance. And Jonah spends the rest of the book upset because he wanted to see them destroyed. 
So that's who Jonah is. But why the sign of Jonah? So Jesus does not mind asking, being asked if he is the Messiah. He's not shy about it. Now, a couple of weeks ago, in between uh, Jesus healing the man in the synagogue with the withered hand and between him casting out the devil from the man who, had, who was both deaf and blind, no, yeah, deaf and blind, he, um, mute and blind, he, he, we get this passage that Matthew gives us where he's quoting the prophet Isaiah. And in that he says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. So Jesus, he's not shy about being the Messiah, but he also doesn't go around blasting it with a megaphone. What Jesus prefers to do is let the works speak for themselves. The works should reveal who he is. If we go back a chapter to Matthew 11, at the beginning of that chapter, John the Baptist is put in prison, and John has the same question. He sends his disciples to go talk to Jesus and ask them, are you the one or should we be looking for another? And Jesus responds to the disciples of John by saying, look, go back and ta- tell John this, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the, good, the poor have the good news preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended in me. So he's, he clearly is happy with saying, look at the signs, they point to who I am. He gets the same problem over in John chapter 10. In John 10, it's Hanukkah, it's called the Feast of Dedications. It's Hanukkah, Jesus is walking through the promenade of the temple having a nice wonderful time. A group of people surround him and they say, tell us plainly, how long will you keep us in suspense? Are you the Messiah? He says, I told you already, but you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. He says, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, in other words, if I'm just walking around and talking nonsense, don't believe me. But if I do them, the works of my Father, Even though you do not believe in me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and that I am in the Father. So the problem with these fellows, the scribes and Pharisees, is that their hearts have been hardened through unbelief. They're asking for a sign as proof of his messiahship But because of the condition of their hearts, nothing that Jesus does will ever be good enough for them. So his response with the sign of Jonah is effectively telling them, look, if everything I've already done isn't enough for you guys, then the only sign that you're going to get going forward is my my resurrection from the dead. Nothing else is going to work. Which brings us to the third question. What does Jesus mean by an evil generation? Did he just pull that phrase out of his hat or does it have some deeper significance in a meaning? And of course the answer is it does. So in Numbers chapter 32, verse 13, Moses says this, and the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. So Jesus is talking to scribes and Pharisees, and they, of course, would have understood that by calling them an evil generation, he's actually bringing them back to that group of of people that Moses led out of Egypt and was trying to bring them into the promised land, but it didn't happen, which we're going to take a look at here. So again, Moses brings them out of Egypt, brings them to Mount Sinai, They receive God's covenant promises. Then they swing on up and they're at the border of the land of Canaan. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. And Moses sends 12 spies into the land. They go into the land and for 40 days they spy it out and they come back and they say, yes, it is true. This land is fantastic. It flows with milk and honey. It's a great place to live. 
but there's just one small problem. In verse 33, they say, And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. Literal giants are in the land. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers in their sight, and so we seemed to them also. Verse, chapter, chapter 14, verse 1, the children of Israel hear this, and it does not go well. They sit down and they cry all night long. They have a miserable night. And then in the next morning, they wake up and they say, you know, we're done with Moses. We're just going to go back to Egypt. It would, it would be better to remain slaves in Egypt than to go and try to deal with these Nephilim. Well, Joshua and Caleb, two of the spies, they stand up and they say, hold on, guys, hold on. Remember everything that God has already done for us. He brought us through the Red Sea. He defeated, Mo he defeated Pharaoh. He's done all these things for us. God is well able to bring us into the promised land. Every, every obstacle that we encounter, we can overcome it. They respond to that by picking up stones. They're about to kill Joshua and Caleb, and boom, God shows up. A God intervention happens. And God says to Moses in verse 11 of chapter 14, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done for them? So here's the problem. What group of people in all of human history, from Adam until this very moment right now, what group of people have seen more signs, more wonders, more miracles than that group of people whom God brought out of Egypt? Right? They saw the 10 plagues with their own eyes. They watched the Nile turn to blood. They watched the death angel come and destroy the firstborn of Egypt. They passed through the Red Sea as though it was dry ground. The waters opened up. They walked through the waters closed back and swallowed Pharaoh's army. Then they get to Mount Sinai. They see fire come down in a giant pillar and it just sits there on the mountain while God gives them the Ten Commandments. When they're thirsty in the wilderness, water comes out of a rock. And not just a little bit. We're talking about enough water to quench the thirst of a million people. When they're hungry in the wilderness... God feeds them with manna from heaven. Literally every day they just wake up, except on Saturday. Every day they wake up, fresh food on the ground. Awesome. But what benefit did it do for them? None. Zero. Every single one of them, all of the men ages 20 and above, 600,000 of them, all but two die in the wilderness in their unbelief. So the point is, is that signs and wonders don't automatically produce or enhance our faith. If they did, when the evil, then that evil generation would have just marched right into the promised land and bulldozed everyone. They would have said, Nephilim, who cares about giants? Like we just sacked Egypt and plundered their goods. God is on our side. What do a few Canaanite strongholds matter to our God? But no, they didn't. Moreover, the signs that the Israelites experienced in the desert set them up with expectations that became a hindrance to future generations and their ability to walk in faith and especially their ability to receive the Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, Paul gives us a series of rhetoricals. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God 
For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, in summarizing this evil generation, whether we're talking about the ancient Israelites who came out of, out of Egypt, or the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus is dealing with in his own day, an evil generation is one that, due to unbelief or hardness of heart, is unable to enter into God's work. And make no mistake, God wanted the Israelites to partner with him, just as he wants us to partner with him today. These people, they were in God's presence. Both groups, they had godly leadership or godly instruction. They were swimming in God's activities, but their unbelief created a barrier between themselves and God, and as a result, God is absent in their inner life, and therefore, they go astray. But the warning is not just to the ancient Israelites and the Pharisees. The warning also extends to us. Let's look at this. In Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, the Bible says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Here it comes to us. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And there we have it. Our sin doth deceive us. For the group that came out of Egypt, and we could use that as an analogy to say they came out of the world, they got saved, they got to the border of the promised land, and what they basically said was, you know, we actually had it pretty good in Egypt. We had a lot of friends there. We had a good time. Maybe this whole killing giants thing isn't for us. It would be better if we went back and were slaves again. But maybe we can negotiate a better deal. We'll be slaves with a view. Because after all, Pharaoh's dead and his firstborn son is dead, but the second son, he was a pretty reasonable guy. So maybe we could work something out. But the truth is that they couldn't. That generation of people, they weren't in the promised land, but neither were they back in Egypt. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. And the question is, how many of us also wander in the desert? We don't fully step into God's kingdom. We don't fully live a kingdom life with Jesus, but of course, we're not back in the world either. We're just somewhere in between in limbo. Now, for the Pharisees, the other group, we could say that they were saved. They knew God. They knew God's commandments. They obeyed him, but they did live under Roman persecution. They had to pay taxes. Nobody likes paying taxes. Taxation is theft. And they had a bumbling fool who was their leader, their king. <laughs> I'm talking about King Herod, you guys. I'm talking about King Herod. But overall, they had it good. And what made their situation even better was that they had their religion. They were unlike their ancestors who were not free to worship in Egypt. They were free to worship. They got to go to synagogue every Saturday. So life was pretty good. But the problem is, is that both groups were deceived by their sin, which kept them from kingdom living. They were not able to perceive that what God was actively doing in their time, in their day, in their generation, and so they stood on the outside. Verse 19, so we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore... While the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, 
but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Let me say that again. They were not united with faith, in faith with those who listened. So obviously Joshua and Caleb are the two who did unite with faith. They did listen. But the question is, what set them apart? Why were Joshua and Caleb so much different? And the answer is, is that Joshua learned to listen and remember as a practice of life. Now, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where he's talking about creating man, God says God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he, both male and female, he created them. That word male in the, in the, in the Hebrew, it literally means to remember. The job description that you gentlemen have here is to remember what the Lord has done. And that's exactly what Joshua did. Joshua was one who remembered. But interestingly, it says here, what we just read, they were not united by faith with those who listened. So signs are something that we see with our eyes. But faith in the Bible is not typically linked with sight. It's actually linked with hearing. Check this out. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, now this is the next generation. The, the, the parents have died off. The kids have grown up. It's now their turn to go into the promised land and, and, and do what they've been told to do. And Moses gives them a very long speech. He says in chapter 4, verse 10, how on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Paul builds upon this in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, Paul is talking about the process of coming to salvation. And he's also dealing with the problem of why the Jewish people in his own era were falling completely into apostasy. Jesus, they basically wholesale rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So in chapter 10, verse 17, Paul says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And that word, word, it's not logos, like written word, it's rhema. It's the spoken word. So faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God spoken in your ears. Which leads me, at least, to a pretty good question, which is why? Why is it that sight is typically a detriment to faith or a deterrent, but hearing builds our faith? And I think about it this way. God spoke words and the universe came into existence. All matter, energy, space, and time. The visible was created by the invisible. Words are a means to an end, and they invite us into something deeper. Consider all the movies that you've ever watched, right? There's a scary scene or an intense scene. The person's just walking down the hallway. There's nothing unique about that, but what happens? The music comes in. The music, the sound draws you in. It, it invites you to something deeper. You see, God is infinite. So the question is, how do we, as finite, limited creatures, comprehend and interact with something infinite? Now, I got to reference in my video there that, that when I was a teenager, I got to experience a little bit of paganism, witchcraft, all that kind of junk. And the pagans don't have this problem. The reason is, what paganism calls gods are merely forces of nature. 
the wind, the rain, the sun, the moon, the stars, animals, birds, fish, humans, all of them are, are visual. And so they're easily represented with statues and carvings. Yahweh, our God, however, is beyond all of these things. So any attempts at imagery of him are idolatrous. So the answer, of course, is words. Because although God is infinite and invisible, he is not inaudible. Words allow the invisible to be expressed. In prayer, we get to talk to God and he listens. And then in revelation, he responds and we listen. So words are how souls communicate. Uh, Oz Guinness, in his book, The Magna Carta of Humanity, says this, no form, only a voice. From that day on, Jews and later Christians have been a people of the word, and words supremely so among all the peoples of the, word, of the earth. Shema, which is the Hebrew word for hear or listen, becomes Israel's central way of knowing God. And that word Shema, it exists there in, in, when Jesus is asked, it comes from Deuteronomy 6, what is the great commandment? It's hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Shema. Words, reading, reading aloud, reciting, listening, paying attention, and remembering are at the heart of faith. Whereas the Bible links sight, images, and appearances to temptation, sin, idolatry, and disloyalty. Not sight, not sight, but sound. Not images, but words. And just to give you a very brief example, consider Eve in the garden. Right? She knew that she was not supposed to eat of the fruit. And what was Satan's question? Did God really say? Let's question the word. But it says when she looked, when she saw the fruit, that it was good and delightful and it could make one wise, that's when temptation came in, that's when covetousness came in. So what we see here is that Joshua and Caleb, they learned how to abide in God's presence. They learned how to hear God's voice. They learned how to remember what God said. And they learned his promises for the future. And, and that allowed them to be men of faith, whereas their fellows all fell in the wilderness. So in John chapter 14, we get this. This is right in between the Last Supper. Jesus has just got done eating. He hasn't been arrested yet. He's relaxing with his disciples. He's giving them a lot of important information about the future that they're going to encounter. And Philip says this to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And here's that phrase again. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. So again, Jesus is always pointing us back to what he's done. This is who I am. This is what I've done. The works reveal who I am. It would be, it's okay to believe on him just for the sake of the works. But it is far better to believe on him knowing who he is knowing what he's inviting us into, and knowing all that he has promised us to do. One of the challenges that we as his people often run into with our faith is that we don't put our faith in him alone. Our faith becomes a matter of systems. It becomes, we, be, we, we put faith in a thing, not in the man himself. Paul, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 I'm sorry, 2 Timothy verse one, chapter 1, verse 12, he's talking about his sufferings as an apostle, and he says this, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom 
I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. You see, I hope that everyone here, that, that, that our theology conforms to orthodoxy. I hope that everyone in here has sound doctrine because without sound doctrine and good theology, we will go astray. But our faith is not in a system. Our faith is in a person, specifically in a personal God. Moses, even to those people back in Deuteronomy, says the same thing, which is, he, he says to them in uh, chapter 4, verse 7, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? So, having said all that, I promised you we'd circle back around to those three things. Greater than the temple, greater than Jonah, greater than Solomon. What is Jesus communicating in those, in those things? Well, greater than, the, greater than Solomon, greater than the king. Jesus is not just a man. He's not a president. He's not a prime minister. He's not some local potentate. No. In Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, we learn that Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords. He comes with the armies of heaven behind him. His eyes are a flame of fire. Out of his tongue is a sharp two-edged sword. And he is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord of all to the glory of the Father. Jesus is more than a mere king. He's the king of kings, but he's also the judge of heaven and earth. Greater than Jonah, he's greater than all other prophets who have come before that. Yea, he's more than all other prophets that have come before him. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Remember, Peter, uh, uh, Philip, have you been with me so long and you don't recognize? And one more thing, he upholds the universe by the words of his power. Finally, greater than the temple, greater than the priests. In Hebrews 4.14, it says, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. I'm going to invite the musicians to come back up. And with every head bow, with eyes closed, let me ask you guys this. Maybe you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior before. You don't know who Jesus is. Well, he's king, he's judge, he's the creator of heaven and earth. He upholds the universe by the word of his power, and he is able to hold your life as well. More than that, he is, a, he is our great high priest. Through the shedding of his blood, he allows us to come to the Father. But even if you are saved, even if you are a child of God, maybe you have received an evil report from the spies just like the children of Israel did. Maybe it was a report from your doctor. Maybe it was a phone call from a family member, a niece, a cousin, an uncle, somebody's in trouble. I don't know what kind of evil report may have come to your life or will come to your life, but I know this. 
just like Joshua and Caleb, our God is able. He is powerful. Whatever obstacles stand in your way, he can overcome them. So with every head bowed, with every eye, eyes closed, if you would like prayer, I would like to pray with you. I would like the opportunity to either invite you into a relationship with Jesus or if you're going through something, to join my faith together with yours to see God work in your life. I will be in the back, Pastor Whitney, Pastor Andy, they will be in the back, and we just invite you to come speak with, speak with us. And I thank you all for your time this morning. Amen.